you can start. Okay, thanks. Uh, so first I would like to thank for this uh, great opportunity. Um, and uh, okay, so in my uh, short talk, I would like to explain you, give you an idea of what stands behind those uh, nice pictures and why I consider them to be interesting. And uh, first I would like to discuss uh, something elementary, uh, how a circle in the two torus looks like. Looks like and uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, so consider the natural projection from R to, to R to mod Z2. And uh, to visualize, we can identify it with the map that uh, sends the plane to the unit cube by taking uh, fractional parts. So here on the left, we see a circle of uh, radius one and on the right, it's image in the two torus. Uh, here, this, this R corresponds to this curve and this R corresponds to this curve, yeah? This is a, a translated unit cubes. Okay, so this is a circle of radius one and uh, now we will start uh, expanding it, namely we'll take a larger and larger uh, radi. So this is a circle of uh, radius two, it's already looked uh, complicated. And this is a circle of uh, radius uh, 500, very impressive. And uh, let's say, uh, let's look uh, for the fun of it. We can uh, zoom in and you see some uh, nice uh, patterns here. In any case, so we can quantify this phenomena by the uh, classical uh, notion of uh, equidistribution. And uh, to be precise, this is what this means. So let's parameterize the curve uh, by gamma t, the circle by gamma t. Then what we have here, this is a known fact that I want to share with you, is that uh, for any nice uh, set in the two torus, the following limit holds, namely the, the measure of the points that, uh, uh, the, the measure of the angles that we, we project uh, to the two torus that land inside the set A is going to converge to the R measure as the radi diverges to infinity. And uh, my interest is in the discrete, in a discrete version, in the following uh, discrete version. So this is, this is something that I refer to as a continuous version. And the natural uh, discrete version is not to take uh, all points in the unit interval, but just look on K over N. And uh, we take also, uh, we take a sequence of uh, radi going to infinity and we look on the pi rho n gamma k over n where pi is the natural projection. Now for this problem, there are two, two regimes, two distinct regimes. One is when there are many points. Uh, this is what you see in the picture. This is the case when we, the radi goes slowly and we, and we have that the uh, n goes uh, fast. So in this case, points become dense and dense on the enlarging circles. So that the, the, the image in the torus follows this uh, continuous curve. And uh, uh, we can deduce the discrete the uniform distribution from the continuous one uh, rather directly. So it's a, in some sense, this is not a very interesting uh, regime. The other regime, I call it the sparse regime, where we have a few points on huge circles. And in this case, what we have is that the consecutive points on the, on the circle are very far. And uh, it, this means precisely that if we look on the two toes, uh, two consecutive points on the circle, this is the red dots projected to the we have a huge circle and this is two consecutive points on this huge circle. And the black curve is the arc that connects them. So, so in this sense that the discrete problem deviates from the continuous one and you can not study the discrete version from the continuous one at least directly. Okay. And now after having uh, this in mind, I want to give some uh, overview of this problem. I, and they give you the motivation that uh, brought me to, to consider it. So what we have here is that uh, in, in a software way, we have continuous sets which become uh, longer and longer in the covering space and become uh, uniformly distributed after we take a quotient uh, by a lattice, yeah? okay? And uh, we sample them uh, discreetly in an even manner. 
so in some sense they should mimic mimic the curve, the continuous curve. And the question that, that we ask is, even if the discrete samples are sparse, does equidistribution still hold, or we can ask, uh, can sparse be too sparse in this in the sense? Can uh, equidistribution be ruined? So this the question for the circle was proposed by my advisor uh, Uri Shapira when we were discussing in our uh, group meetings uh, uh, this this problem above for uh, different problem in more in a more complicated uh, set. Um, and now I want to start uh, giving some answers to the questions that I posed. And before that, a bit, uh, I just want to know that I will not be only interested in K over N, but also in uh, rotation of the points K over N. Uh, and uh, this means that I will not on look on only on these red dots, but I can uh, rotate. Um, and the, the first result is that the polynomial sparsity is uh, stable. Uh, to be precise, so consider a sequence of uh, Radi going to infinity, and, but bounded by some power of n, arbitrary power of n, fixed one. Then we have equidistribution for any choice of a sequence of, uh, of angles. And this is why I call it stable. And another a thing that comes out of this theorem is that if we, for example, look on a very big uh, circle and uh, uh, some points on it, and we start pari omega, then the equidistribution is uh, uniform. It is, uh, doesn't affect it by this perturbation. And uh, OK, so now I come to the next thing that the sparse can be too sparse. And uh, this is actually a rather quick corollary from the Dirichlet-Diophant Diophantine approximation theorem, but for those of you may who may know, but I will not give details. So the corollary is the following. So fix an, arbit an angle. Then there exists, and for any, let the epsilon be small as you wish. Then there exists a bad sequence, such that the projections of this uh, dilated points will land in some small fixed neighborhood. So in particular, there is no equidistribution, there is no density, and it's, uh, in some sense, it is very dramatic, okay? And, and a, a nice thing that I want to remark here is that uh, by the theorem that we had, such a bad sequence much, must exceed polynomial growth, but this Dirichlet theorem gives us that uh, it shouldn't go too fast. You can find a bad sequence, which is, uh, bounded the sub exponent. Uh, okay, so this is this uh, failure of equidistribution, and uh, this led us to ask: Is it rare? Is it rare? In what sense? So fix a bad sequence of uh, dilations uh, such that this equidistribution fails. What happens if we would consider uh, rotating the initial points a bit? It has dramatic effects because Rn is very big. And the second result is as following. So a fix an arbitrary sequence going to infinity. It can be n to the n to the n, never mind. Then equidistribution holds, but for a almost all, almost all a omega with respect to natural mesh. And finally, I want to hint towards the more general results. Uh, the, actually, the results that uh, can be obtained are for One minute. Uh, for or obtained for analytic curves in RD with a certain uh, rationality property. And uh, regarding the proof, so the general scheme is uh, through Weil's equidistribution criterion. And uh, once you apply certain uh, classical estimates of exponential sums, everything boils down to a certain uh, control of sub-level sets of uh, analytic functions. And uh, to this problem, actually, there is something that I consider to be nice, is there is a connection to the theory of all minimal structures, uh, which provides the correct tools to handle, to handle such a problem, in my opinion, in a very elegant way. And uh, yeah, okay, so this is uh, everything that I, uh, I had to say, and uh, thanks, thanks for, for listening.
Exactly on time. Very good. <laughs> and very good talk. Thank you so much. The talk was really, really good. Um, um, in the meanwhile, while we change the speakers, I will say that... Um, can, can you uh, stop share the screen, please? That um, um, we will choose, the committee will choose, the committee headed by uh, Misha Sodin will choose the uh, three best talks. It's not based on the, I mean, they, they use the abstracts to choose uh, the six talks and based on the talk quality, they will choose uh, the three. Uh, just to, to be slightly more fun and game-wise, uh, where is uh, Uri? Just a second. Uri. I, I want, ah, here you are. Okay, so yeah, hi. We are starting in in the uh, the second talk. Uh, you can yeah, start. Sure. Are you do you see the Do you see the screen shared? We we see, and we also see the laser. Okay. So can I start? Yes, please. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, the talk will be about classifying processes through finitary maps, and I'll just say that that on the right side of the screen the presentation runs, and on the left side the gray the gray part of the screen are just uh, previous definitions and remarks. So all processes in that in that talk are, are seem to be stationary stochastic processes, where stationary means that shifting it by time doesn't change the distribution of the process. Now, our main problem is classifying processes up to isomorphism, or in other words, given two processes, how can we de uh, decide in an easy way whether these processes are isomorphic one to each other or not? But for that, we need the notions of isomorphism and factors. So a process Y is a factor of process X if there exists a map phi, so that phi commutes with the shift operator, and phi x equals y. And if in addition that phi is invertible, then that phi is an isomorphism, and x and y are said to be isomorphic. One important class of uh, stationary processes are the IAB processes, which includes also the infinite sequence of coin tosses or infinite sequences of dice rolls. And one of the first questions in classification theory of ergodic theory uh, was of Halmos that asks whether these two processes are isomorphic one to, to each other. And Kolmogorov and Sinai gave a negative answer for that, for that question by showing that there is a quantity uh, named entropy that is assigned to each process, and that uh, quantity entropy is an invariant under isomorphism, which means that for two processes to be isomorphic, it is necessary that their entropy, which is denoted here by H, will be equal. Now, I won't explain exactly what entropy is, but it is enough for that talk to know that entropy is a certain function of processes denoted by H, which measure, measures how rare a sample of the process is, at least for ergodic processes. But this is not for us. And so back to the question of Helmos, the coin tosses process has entropy log two, the dice rolls process has entropy log six, so these two entropies are not equal, and so these two processes are not isomorphic, as it's written here. Now, uh, interesting enough is the, the converse of kolmogorov sinai's result uh, is also in the case of IID processes. And that's, that is Ornstein's isomorphism theorem that states that for IID processes X and Y, once we know they have the same entropy, then we can conclude that they are already isomorphic onto each other. So in other words, entropy is a full characterization of the isomorphism classes in the case of IID processes. Um, so till now, I talked only about classifying processes with, with respect to isomorphism, which I showed before what does it mean. But in fact, I want to talk about classifying processes up to finitary isomorphism, which is a stricter notion of isomorphism. And now I'll explain what does it mean. So a factor map is said to be finitary if any coordinate of the image depends only on finitely many coordinates of the domain's process. And accordingly, a factor is finitary and isomorphism is a finitary isomorphism if the maps involved in are finitary. And just to give a sense of what finitary means, 
I'll give some example of a non-finite Turing map. So in that example, our domains process X is just the coin tosses process. And here is a sample of that, of, that, uh, of that domains process. And down here, I'll write the image of that sample under the, pro under the map phi, which is defined as follows. The kth coordinate equals one, if that condition holds, and zero otherwise. And that condition is that for some n, there exists a sequence of ones between the k plus n coordinate and the k plus two n coordinate, okay? So in order to determine the value of the image here, so we need to read that coordinate and the next one. And here we can already stop because we see that, uh, that, the, value, that uh, the condition holds for n equals one and one can put here the value one. So that value depends on two coordinates of the domains process. To determine the next, the next value here, so one can see from reading that sample the treatment here, uh, that the, the condition doesn't hold for all n lesser than 10 or so. And it might happen that uh, with positive probability, the condition uh, doesn't hold for any n. But, and one should put here zero. But in order to validate that, one should read the whole sequence up to infinity, and only then to conclude that one need to write here zero. So that value is positive probability, depends on infinitely, infinitely many coordinates of the domain's process, and so this map is not finitary. So in short, one can say the following, if we want to implement a map by a machine, it is necessary for it to be finitary. So now back to the classification problem. Now it, now it, it makes sense. It, 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 is, it is even more relevant and important to know how to classify processes up to finitary isomorphism and not just isomorphism. And indeed, the isomorphism theorem of Ornstein was given a finitary counterpart by Mike Keane and Mirs Mordinsky in 1980. And they showed that for uh, ID processes X, Y, Having equal entropy doesn't imply only that they are isomorphic, but in fact, they are finitarily isomorphic, okay? And their success in giving a, a finitary counterpart for a classification theorem arose the natural question about other classification theorems. There are many other classification theorems. Do they have also a finitary counterpart? So in my work, I discussed these three theorems, but now I'll focus on the first one. This is again a theorem of Ornstein which states the following, all factors of IID processes are again isomorphic to IID processes. And a finitary counterpart for that statement should be as follows. Is it true that all finitary factors of IID processes are finitarily isomorphic to IID processes? And that question was suggested by Rudolf uh, almost 40 years ago. And after that, it was conjectured by uh, Smolodinsky to be true after some progress on that problem was, uh, was done. In, that was in 93. And what I found out in my work is that the answer for that question, maybe surprisingly, is not true. So this th uh, classification theorem doesn't have a finitary counterpart, as is the case for other classification theorems. And in the few minutes I have, I'll try to explain how this is done. So our proof resembles, in a sense, the idea of the Kolmogorov Sinai result I showed before. So they showed that the quantity entropy is a quantity assigned to processes that uh, one, can use to one can use it to distinguish between processes up to isomorphism. And what I've done is to introduce a new quantity called, uh, I'll call it now concatenation entropy, and it is denoted by HC, and it is a function on processes I won't explain exactly what does it mean, but if entropy measures how rare a sample of the process is, so concatenation entropy measures how much one can deduce about the rareness of the sample. So if we're reading it piecewise only for IID process, for example, it gives the same mm -hmm. thing as entropy. So, so on IID processes, the entropy and concatenation entropy are just the same thing. An important property of that is that just as entropy is an invariant under isomorphism, the concatenation entropy is invariant under finitary isomorphism. So it gives a more refined uh, quantity to distinguish between processes. And as a 
consequence of that, once we, uh, for a process to be finitarily isomorphic to an ID process, uh, it is necessary that the entropy and the concatenation entropy will be equal. And finally, to refute Smoldinsky conjecture, uh, what we've shown is that there are plenty of finite refactors of ID processes that do not satisfy that condition and actually have entropy completely different of the entropy. And this completes the proof. Minutes. So, as I said, this completes the proof. And I, we saw here that this is a necessary condition for a process to be finitarily isomorphic to an ID process. And it would be nice to find some sufficient condition for a process to be finitarily isomorphic to an ID process. This would be interesting. And so just uh, at the end, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Mike Hoffman, for all his support and to thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I forgot to say that uh, Michael Bersutsky is from the Technion and uh, Uri Gabor from the Hebrew University. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Amitai Kamber, also from the Hebrew University. Uh, just a second, oops. Uh, let me do this. Okay, do you see Amitai? Yeah. Uh, Amitai, whenever you're ready. Uh, okay. Good luck. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. I will talk about optimal lifting for SLNZ, and it's based on joint works with Costa Golubev and Hagai Lavna. So uh, let's talk about strong approximation in SLNZ. So for ring R, let SLNR be n by n matrices over R with determinant equal to one in the ring R. And Q is a natural number. So the strong approximation theorem for SLNZ states that when we take uh, all matrices in SLNZ and take the modulo Q, uh, this map is onto Okay, it's not a very hard theorem. It's an exercise in basic number theory. And in other words, every X in SLNZ, SLNZ over QZ can be lifted to many elements in SLNZ. For example, when X is 3, 0, 0, 2 in SL2Z over 5Z, it would whose determinant is six, which is one in Z over five Z, we can lift it to this element gamma, three, five, 10, 17, whose determinant is one in uh, Z. And when we take this element modulo five, we get uh, this element. Okay, so the natural question is, how small can gamma be? Okay, um, and by small we mean uh, the size of its maximal coordinate in absolute value, okay? Um, so here for SL2Z, we have a, a rather strong results. And this theorem states, uh, by Sarnak from a couple of years ago, it states that for every epsilon, uh, as Q goes to infinity, almost every element in SL2Z over QZ can be lifted to an element gamma in SL2Z where the size of gamma is bounded by Q to the three over two plus uh, a little error that we allow ourselves. Um, by almost every element, I mean here and in the rest of the talk, uh, all but a tiny fraction of the elements in a set. And this theorem is optimal for the following reasons. Um, the first uh, exercise to, to do is to show that when we take elements in SL2Z and bound them by T, uh, the number of such elements, which is the number of solutions to AD minus BC equal one with all of them bounded by T, grows like T squared. Okay, this is not that easy exercise. And the second exercise is easier, and it is the size of SL2Z over QZ is something like Q to the three, at least when Q is prime, and in general, it behaves similarly. 
And when we look at this, we notice that um, if we want to lift almost all of the elements in SL2Z over QZ to elements in SL2Z, we must, must take T to be Q uh, to the three over two. So the exponent three over two is optimal, okay? Uh, I must mention that we said almost every element, lifting all of the elements is a different question, which uh, is a different story and we will not discuss. Okay, so we want to generalize the same question to SLN Z. In the case of SLN Z, uh, the number of elements in SLN Z over QZ grows like Q to the N squared minus one. Essentially since uh, we set all of the coordinates as we want and the last coordinate we use it to uh, make the determinant one. Uh, are other uh, exercises to show that the number of uh, gammas in SLNZ with coordinate bounded by T is uh, something like T to the N square minus N. The reason for this is that for a random matrix uh, with integer coordinates, the determinant behaves something like T to the N. And to be one, the probability is T to the minus N. So, uh, so this is the result that we get. So the natural conjecture from uh, these two consideration and the uh, SLN2 consideration is uh, as follows. I call it optimal lifting for principal congruent subgroups of SLN Z. Uh, that uh, for every epsilon greater than zero as Q grows to infinity, for almost every X in SLN Z over QZ, there exists some gamma in SLN Z of the right size that is a lift of X. Um, okay, so this conjecture is uh, widely open at the moment, uh, but it can also be generalized further and then we can answer partial questions. So uh, we can generalize it for actions on SLN Z over QZ sets. Okay, let X U be SLN Z over QZ set for which SLN Z over QZ act transitively. It means that when we take SLN Z modulo Q, it's also act transitively. Okay, for example, the set SLN Z over QZ itself. Okay, so the conjecture in this case is as follows. For every epsilon greater than zero, as the size of the set goes to infinity, for almost every pair of elements uh, in the uh, set, there exists some gamma uh, of the right size that move one element to the other element. Okay, um, this is a generalization of the previous uh, theorem. Uh, in the previous theorem, we didn't have two elements, but one element, but in the previous theorem, the set was symmetric. So uh, when we take S X XQ equal to SL and Z over QZ, this is exactly the same uh, conjecture. Uh, so what I will talk about is some partial results for this conjecture. Um, so for every Q, let XQ be an SLN, oh, sorry. So uh, for a prime Q, let P2FQ be the set of subspaces of dimension one in FQ to the three, which is the two dimensional projective plane over FQ. Uh, the size of this set grows like Q to the square. And it has a transitive SL2 FQ, which is the same as SL2 Z over QZ action. And I just said that the uh, size of elements in, I remind that the size of elements in SL3 Z with coordinates are bounded by T, it grows like T to the six. So the theorem uh, that uh, we proved together with Hagai Lovner said that the optimal lifting property holds in this specific uh, condition, uh, which means that for almost every two subspaces, uh, there exists some element in SL3Z whose coordinates are bounded by Q, Q to the one over three that moves one subspace to the other. Um, so um, in the last minute or so, I will talk about how did we prove it. 
So um, the way we proved it is we gave a general method of solving the optimal lifting conjecture by reducing it to some fixed point conjecture. Um, essentially what the fixed point conjecture says is that uh, on average over a, a large now uh, over a large ball in SLNZ, the average number of fixed points on in the set is a, more or less one with a, some explicit mention of the error. And a, together with Costa Golubev, we we proved a very general theorem that says that the fixed point conjecture implies the optimal lifting conjecture. And the reason that we could solve it for the projective plane and a small number of other cases is that we managed to prove the fixed point conjecture in this case. Okay, um, so uh, I have a, a half a minute left, so I will just mention that uh, the uh, motivation for, uh, for this question comes from automorphic forms and and approximation to the generalized Ramanujan conjecture, uh, whatever that is, and um, that is why Sarnak uh, gave his result. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this lovely talk and interesting. Um, so we will move to the next uh, speaker. Um, the next speaker is Yoni Kasten from uh, the Weizmann Institute. Just a sec. Yoni, here you are. So I put you on the... So the, the next talk is by Yoni Kasten, Kasten from Weizmann Institute. Do I say your name correctly? Uh, Kasten, do you hear me, Kasten. by so, the way? Yeah, we hear you well. Um, whenever you're ready, you can start. Okay. So hi, my name is uh, Yoni, and I will talk about the uh, algebraic uh, characterization of relational camera fold measurements in uh, multiple images. And uh, this talk is based on the, on the following uh, three papers published in the last uh, two years. Okay, so the camera projection matrix is a three by four matrix that projects 3D points to a uh, 2D image point by multiplying a 3D point in homogeneous coordinate with the camera matrix resulted in a 2D point in homogeneous uh, coordinate defined up to a scale factor. And from two camera matrices, it is possible to define the following a uh, three by three matrix. And this matrix is called the fundamental matrix, where it holds that Fij equal Fji transpose, and the rank of Fij is uh, two. And geometrically, given a 2D point in one image, xj, this point can be projected from any 3D point on this uh, 3D red ray, but for each different 3D point, it will be projected to a different 2D point on the second image, where all of them lie on the same line called an equipolar line. And the fundamental matrix maps a point from one image to its corresponding equipolar line in the second image, where the corresponding point must be lie on. And this resulted in the uh, following constraint, xi transpose fij xj equals zero, where f is a fundamental matrix, three by three matrix, and xi and xj are image coordinates represented as homogeneous coordinates. Then using this constraint, it is possible to calculate the fundamental matrix from point correspondence sets between image i and image j. Then, Using singular value decomposition, this matrix, matrix should be projected to rank two to uh, form a valid fundamental matrix. A special case of fundamental matrix is in the calibrated case. This matrix is called the essential matrix and it has two identical singular values. This is the case that the calibration information is applied on the image coordinate. Both essential and fundamental matrices define, are called a bifocal tensor and define the relative geometry between two images of two views. 
From the fundamental metrics, it is possible to extract the camera metrics set, and they are defined up to a global 3D projective transformation where in the calibrated setup, the ambiguity is reduced to similarity transformation that preserves angle between the views. The problem of, stru of structure for motion is to take a set of images and to extract the camera matrices that captured the images and to reconstruct the 3D uh, geometry of the scene. For two views uh, extracted from a pairwise relation computed independently in a noisy setup, uh, the pairwise um, cameras do not agree with each other, and it is needed to average the noise to get a set of n cameras that uh, agree as much as possible with the pairwise noisy measurement. This process is called motion gathering. Our first contribution in this work is to provide a complete algebraic characterization of the manifold of bifocal tensors for N cameras. So given N images with computed bifocal tensor between them, ours is the first work to answer the question what makes these fundamental matrices consistent with each other. We do that by defining a block matrix called N-view fundamental matrix where the ij block of this matrix is a fundamental matrix between view i and view j. And this matrix is of size 3n by 3n and defines the relative uh, information between n views. It holds that this matrix is symmetric and the rank of each non-diagonal block is two to form a valid fundamental matrix. Similarly, we define the n view essential matrix where we further uh, require that uh, the singular value of non-diagonal blocks are identical. Our first theorem says that an n-view fundamental matrix is consistent with non-collinear n cameras if and only if it has rank six with three positive and three negative eigenvalues, and each row blocks of this matrix is of rank three. Our second theorem says that an n-view essential matrix is consistent with non-collinear n cameras if, in addition, the three positive and three negative eigenvalues are three pairs with the same absolute value, and also that the sum of uh, the three eigenvectors corresponding to the positive eigenvalues and the three eigenvectors corresponding to the negative eigenvalues form a block rotation matrix. Our second contribution is to provide an optimization framework to project measured bifocal tensor to the nearest manifold. So given a, a noisy measurement between uh, images of the bifocal tensors, we average them to cameras. And uh, one major uh, challenge here is that usually there are missing entries between views which are needed to be completed. And we use techniques analogous, analogous to a parallel graph rigidity in projective spaces to design an efficient projection algorithm. So given a set of images, we compute pairwise relation independently between the views and we compute a triplet cover of the viewing graph. Then using an optimization method called the ADMM, we project a blocks of a three views to be consistent three view F or E where the missing entries marked in red are completed uniquely. Then we extract the cameras from this matrix and perform a final refinement of the cameras and the 3D geometry. We further characterize and handle the generate cases. Our third theorem says that an end view a fundamental matrix is consistent with collinear N cameras if and only if it has rank four with two positive and two negative eigenvalues and that the rank of the row blocks is two. And our fourth theorem says that an N-view essential matrix is consistent with collinear N cameras if, in addition, the four uh, eigenvalues share the same absolute values and that the sum of the eigenvectors form a matrix with orthogonal blocks. We handle such cases by defining virtual camera as an unknown 3D point where um, uh, that uh, this point is observed from uh, three views and we define the uh, bifocal uh, tensors from this point to the cameras. Now, instead of three collinear cameras, 
we have four non-collinear cameras, which we can handle successfully. We further uh, show some results. Our implementation demonstrates the efficiency of this algorithm and achieves Here you can see our results for the uncalibrated setup. and for calibrated setups. Here is the green, we mark in green, the camera matrices. The images here actually come from internet photos of a, a tourist photos of famous location in the world. We can also handle collinear motion of cameras taken, of images taken for cameras of a driving uh, car. Here you can see some results. The ground truth camera poses are marked in green, our results marked in red, and the results of a previous approach, which, which are less accurate than ours, marked in uh, blue. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you, Yoni. Thank you very much. Especially that you chose uh, that your model uh, statue was in the snow, so it kind of cooled off the atmosphere. So thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, okay. Second. Um, so the next speaker is a lad. Kozlov from the Ibu University. Uh, I will uh, try to, ah, here you are. I put you on spotlight. Um, okay, uh, Elad, uh, so whenever Okay, you hi, thanks for uh, having you, me, me here to talk. Luck, yeah. um, so I'm going to be talking about how to count curves and I hope you will enjoy it. Um, so an old question in enumerative geometry is determining the number of curves passing through a given uh, number of points uh, that we have to choose in order to get a finite answer. So this is a really old question. The ancient Greeks already know the answer for uh, degree two and one curves. In the 19th century, there was a lot of activity in the, on, this, on this questions. For example, Steiner calculated that given eight points in the plane, there are 12 different uh, degree three curves. So there is this one, and then there is 11 other degree three curves passing through those eight points. So uh, the next revolution uh, came a century later when physicists used these diodes of Witten to correctly conjecture certain counts. So they correctly conjecture the number of curves in a quintic threefold, uh, much to the surprise of the mathematical community. They also used ideas by Gromov, uh, which uh, introduced uh, geomorphic maps. This gave, the ma gave a much more flexible setting for those uh, counting set uh, questions. So what's uh, gromov witten theory? The idea is to count uh, geomorphic maps using a general strategy of enumerative geometry. You construct a modelized space, a parameterization space for the object that you want to count. You compactify it, and then you impose enough condition on the modelized space uh, for it to be uh, to get a, fine, uh, a zero dimensional solution space, uh, similar to a linear algebra, but it's not a linear question, so you'll get more solutions. And then you count those solutions with methods from intersection theory. So this was a, gave, like, was a big breakthrough, breakthrough in complex enumerative geometry, but what about real enumerative geometry? And there, so can we count uh, real algebraic curves in the real projective uh, plane? 
So this is a much more subtle question. It's like counting uh, real zeros of a single variable polynomial is harder. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Welsh and J managed to define counts of uh, real algebraic curves in dimension two and three. And it's uh, Jake uh, Solomon reinterpreted uh, his counts in the framework of open Gromov within theory. He realized that you can embed, realize uh, the real projective plane as a Lagrangian submanifold. And then uh, ask how many geomorphic maps uh, with uh, boundaries on the real projective plane uh, you have. So, uh, using those ideas, uh, Solomon and Tukhachinsky managed to define counts of geomorphic disks in uh, arbitrary dimension. They used ideas uh, by uh, Fukaya, a generating function. So, what's this generating function? It's called the superpotential. And it has values in uh, a graded ring. Uh, it's a power series in over a graded ring. And th then if you want to ask how many degree beta curves with K boundary point constraint you have, then you should look at the coefficient of T to the power of beta and S to the power of K. Uh, this uh, generating function is really a manifestation of the general strategy in enumerative geometry. You have to uh, construct a, a uh, point constraints, which the Bs, and uh, to cut the dimension of the model I space, uh, you have those operator MK that encodes as information about the model I space, and then you have an intersection pairing in order to actually get a count. So, but we still have a problem. Uh, when uh, trying to count curves in even dimensions, uh, those uh, counts uh, vanish for technical reasons. Um, the, the super if the superpotential takes values in a commutative differential graded algebra, then odd elements, uh, powers of odd elements vanish. Hence, uh, if an our formal variable that accounts for those uh, point boundary constraints is a of uh, odd dimension, so we won't get any uh, uh, counts of geomorphic curves passing through uh, more than one point. So in our work, we had to define, uh, we, we had to develop this theory to work in a non-commutative differential graded algebra set. So we need to cut the dimension of the model I space. And this means to construct those point constraints, and those are solutions to an integral differential equation. So uh, uh, generally, it's a really hard question to solve it, but uh, we do have help from the Fukaya infinity, stru infinity structure. So uh, we do have any uh, those geomorphic disks, they have, uh, they give rise to algebraic structure uh, because they have a non-trivial uh, intersection between them. And this gives us more structure to actually solve this differential equation. So what we had to do, uh, we had to define those operators over uh, a non-commutative differential graded algebra, uh, and they should satisfy those A infinity relations if we are going to have any luck on solving those equations. We had to find the right definition for the intersection uh, pairing. And we had to develop an obstructure theory to solving those differential equation in a non-commutative over a non-commutative differential graded algebra. So why is a, it it's hard to work in this non-commutative settings? Those uh, the infinity structure really uh, gives us a lot of information about those obstructions to solve the uh, those uh, differential equations. And many of them vanish in the commutative case. So if we have this uh, uh, one dimensional obstruction, uh, then its boundary uh, will, uh, will uh, uh, have this relations and it will just cancel out in, this, in the commutative settings. But in the non-commutative settings, uh, we are left with uh, those the obstruction to solving those equation has have a, a non-trivial 
boundary, a zero dimensional uh, non-trivial boundary that we, uh, that we must take care of. Um, nevertheless, we managed to, to develop an obstruction theory for constructing those point constraints. Um, and we showed that they, uh, uh, that, uh, they satisfy uh, twisted, their element in a twisted RAM complex. And this uh, extra structure allowed us to uh, use techniques from algebraic to show, uh, topology and show that they actually vanish. So we can actually solve those differential equations. So uh, to summarize, uh, this paved the way to actually construct and count. How much do time do I have? Uh, two minutes, sorry. I mean, it's part of the medium. Two minutes. Two minutes. So, um, so to summarize, uh, we, we couldn't, uh, there was a problem in uh, defining those counts in, e in even dimensions, uh, but uh, we managed to construct uh, counts of uh, geolomorphic curves uh, with those Lagrangian boundary condition in even dimension. And our counts may have uh, arbitrary number of uh, boundary point constraints, and we can define them in arbitrary even dimension. So uh, this is a new result. And uh, what's cool about the old problem is that uh, it didn't matter which uh, points you choose, uh, we, you, already, you always got the same answer. Uh, if you chose the same eight, different eight points, you still get 12 degree three curves. We show something similar that uh, our, uh, we can, uh, the point we get this, no matter how we choose those point constraints, we'll get the same uh, uh, results of the count. Um, so thank you very much uh, for having me uh, talk here. I um, hope you enjoyed the talk. Tada, tada. Thank you so much. I, I didn't expect that the speakers will be so uh, to the rules. Thank you so much. I thought that I will be, have to be much more nastier. Um, so thank you a lot for, for this. I think the committee will have a very difficult uh, job. Um, okay. Our next speaker is, uh, just a second. My next speaker is Shir Peleg from uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Shir, you can start whenever you want. Okay. Uh, so, hello. Thank you very much for uh, this opportunity. And today I'm going to talk about the generalized Sylvester Galai type theorem for quadratic polynomials. This is based on a joint work with my advisor, Professor Omir Spilka. So the problem we are facing in this uh, line of work is the following. Assuming you have Q, a set of, a finite set of polynomials of total degree at most two over N variables. So this is the set, Q1 through QM is the set of, of polynomials. And assuming that you, and assume that your set has the following property. So whenever you take two uh, different polynomials from the set, QI and QJ, and you take a alpha, a common zero of QI and QJ, then there exists a third polynomial in the set, QK, that vanishes on this point as well. So if you have a set of polynomials that satisfy these conditions, then our theorem states that the dimension of the linear span of the polynomials in Q is bounded by a lambda, where lambda is a, an, a, is a, a universal constant. And by universal constant, I mean that it does not depend on the number of polynomials you have in the set or the number of variables on which they rely. This extends an earlier result by Spilka that proved a specific case of this theorem where it was the same case for every such alpha. So the formal statement of our theorem is the following. There exists a universal constant lambda, such that whenever you take a set, of pairwise linearly independent irreducible homogeneous polynomials of the great most two. And assume that the set has the following property. So whenever you choose two polynomials from the set, the product of the rest of the polynomials in the set is in the radical of the ideal generated by QI and QJ. Then the dimension of the linear span of the polynomials in the set is at most lambda. 
And I can switch uh, uh, vanishing properties with radical membership because we are working over the complex field. Uh, and we can imply Hilbert's null Stellensatz. So let me take a minute and explain why we call this theorem a Sylvester Galai type theorem. So for this, we call the original Sylvester Galai theorem, which is a theorem from discrete geometry that states that given M points in the real plane that are not all contained in one line, there must be a line that goes through exactly two of the points. Cayley theorem is an extension of Sylvester Galai theorem for the complex plane. Here we have some more extreme cases, but it states that if you have a set of M points that are not contained in a two dimensional complex subspace, then there must be a line that goes through exactly two of the points. Um, so this theorem have uh, dual versions, which are algebraic theorem. And they are uh, the following. So if you take a set of vectors, which are pairwise linearly independent, and they have the following property. Whenever you take two vectors from the set, then there is a third vector in the set that is spanned by these two vectors. Then, the, then your entire vectors or the dimension of the linear span of the vectors is bounded by two or three, depending on the underlying field, whether we're working over the reals or the complex field. Uh, now, this is a very interesting theorem because um, it's, it sounds very basic and it uses very uh, basic algebraic def definitions, but the only known proof for this theorem is using a reduction to ge geometric Sylvester Galai theorem. And indeed, the, the, the dimension varies uh, depend, uh, uh, when we take different underlying fields of the vectors. So it is a very interesting algebraic statement. And it can be extended or it, it, it correlates to a different algebraic uh, statement, which is the following uh, problem uh, regarding uh, linear forms. So if we have L, uh, a finite collection of pairwise linearly independent linear forms, which are polynomials of total degree one or linear polynomials, and they have the following properties. So whenever you take two polynomials from the set and there is a third polynomial in the set that vanishes whenever those two polynomials vanish. Then the dimension of the entire uh, space, uh, of the space generated by this linear form is at most two or three, uh, again, depending where your coefficient lives. And this can be proven by an easy reduction to the ve uh, vector version that I just stated above. Now, this theorem can be generalized or can be hypothesized. Uh, does the same property hold for higher degree polynomials? So once we have this local property, uh, we, uh, we have a bound on the dimension. So this question was raised by Beacon, Mitman, and Saxena in 2013 and by Gupta in 2014. And they asked the following questions. So assuming you have a set of pairwise linearly independent of total degree at most R. And whenever you take two distinct polynomials from the set, you know that the product of the rest of the polynomials vanishes. Can you bound the dimension of, of the linear span of the polynomials or can you even bound the algebraic rank of the polynomials? So when R is equal one or the bound the degrees at most one, this follows from Sylvester Galai theorem that I just stated or Cayley theorem. Uh, combining with the fact that ideas generated by linear forms are prime ideal, ideals. When R is equal to, this is our result. And when R is greater or equal than three, this is widely open and we believe it to be very interesting. So the motivation behind this kind of question uh, first comes from the fact that these are very natural questions and they seem um, uh, that they should, we should be able to answer them. And the second motivation is the search for efficient algorithms for polynomial identity testing, which is a problem in theoretical computer science. And in this problem, we want to find uh, deterministic algorithms uh, to, uh, that given two polynomial formulas, uh, determine whether they compute the same polynomial. So I want, have time to go into the details, but these kind of problems closely relate to uh, polynomial identity testing. And this is 
a very, very open, interesting and open problem in theoretical computer science. And indeed, uh, I, in a later paper, when we proved, uh, uh, we proved the stronger version of this theorem and we described the uh, new algorithms for, uh, uh, for polynomial identity testing for some subclasses. Uh, so again, I won't have time to go into the proof, but I have two more minutes, so I'll describe uh, the main tools. And a half. Okay. <laughs> uh, so one, uh, one of the main tools that we use in our proof is the following structure theorem that categorizes what are the possible cases for which a product of quadratic polynomials lies in the radical of an ideal generated by two polynomials. And we prove that in this case, one of the three following ca cases must hold. So either one of the polynomials QK is in the span of A and B. So either A and B span a polynomial from the product, or A and B span a reducible quadratic polynomial, which is a product of two linear forms, or that there are two linear forms and uh, such that both A, B, and one of the polynomials from the product are in the ideal generated by those two linear forms. So by, this implies that A and B have some small rank uh, measure, uh, and I won't get again into the definition, but these are the uh, cases that we categorize. So it's not very hard to see that all these three cases are indeed possible and different. So you can see that you have uh, different, different cases. You can construct product of quadratics in radical of an ideal generated by two quadratics uh, that satisfy exactly one of the conditions. And our structure theorem states that these are the only possible cases. Um, and we combine uh, this tool, the structure theorem, together with the robust version of Sylvester Galay theorem, which is a theorem due to Dvir, Saraf, Vigerson, and Barag, Dvir, Vigerson, and Yehudayov. And I won't get into the detail of the, of the theorem, but um, we combine these two together, uh, together with a lot of case analysis to prove uh, the main theorem. So I have one minute, but I'll let you, I'll tell you that we have plenty open questions uh, that are arising from this line of work. So we can ask similar questions for higher degree polynomials. We can ask uh, similar questions when the property, the vanishing property holds uh, whenever three polynomials vanish together or five polynomials vanish together. This is what we call higher than dimensional equivalences. And of course, working over positive characteristic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you 